ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Unity CEO, John Riccatella. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Unite 2016. It's been an amazing year since many of us got together in Boston for Unite 15. And before we start, I want to thank everyone here for choosing Unity as their platform de for development. We never forget how important you are and why you're the lifeblood of our business. Now, as always, we remain committed to three core principles. I talk about these a lot. Democratizing development. This is really all about making it so that everyone can bring their creations to life, whether they're game makers or AR, VR makers. We want to make it possible and easy. Solving hard problems. We support over 25 platforms, beautiful graphics, multiplayer, complex challenges. You know, products like Atom come out of Unity. These are hard problems. And enabling developer success. We know, I know, how hard it is to make a profit in the game industry. And we're here to help you be successful. One of the statistics we're proud of is in the last 12 months, we've actually paid our developers in aggregate more than we brought in in total revenue for Unity. We're here to help you be successful in this industry. Now, these principles, these three principles, have really got us to a clear understanding of what's important. And at GDC earlier this year, I talked about four areas of focus. Graphics, quality and stability, efficiency, and platform growth. And I'd like to give you a brief update now on how we're doing on each of these fronts. And I'll start with graphics. Now, graphics is core to what you do regardless of platform. And it's a constant area of focus for all of us at Unity, whether it's the team in Montreal, San Francisco, Bellevue, Bel uh, Ukraine, and importantly, Paris or Copenhagen. And in many ways, I think Adam showed the way. It was a short film created by a very small team using Unity, rendered in real time so you could see all the possibilities. It used cin cinematic image effects like uh, screen space and retrace reflections, depth of field, tone mapping, color grading, and more. And all of these are available on the asset store. Now, the team that built this amazing product um, also put together some custom tools, including volumetric fog, a transparency shader, motion blur, to cover their specific needs. And these assets, too, are available on the asset store, giving you everything you need to create something equally spectacular. Now, we've also, on the graphic side, recruited an amazing team in Paris, and we're going to highlight some of their work today. Um, the idea here is to do even better, cooler, more interesting things. If, in a way, the best talent, the hardest problems. Now, these guys are focusing on very specialized problems, like advanced particles, or lighting, or photogrammetry. And today, you're going to see a couple of demos, and one in particular to highlight their work. And you can see the actual specific tools and how they come together and how they work. Now, this is going to be augmented by some other demos that you're going to see from some of our partners, where you see beautiful games played beautifully and how you can sort of dream of where it all goes. Now, more on graphics. Last year, we announced support for Metal, um, iOS Metal. We're deepening our support this year adding uh, CPU instancing on Unity 5.5 and a lot more. Um, Philippe will be showing you a lot about that. Um, we're also talking today about support for Vulkan. Vulkan is the next uh, generation OpenGL. It was designed as a low overhead API, um, giving graphics programmers the ability to control and optimize hardware resources to deliver faster and richer graphics on screens. Now, Vulkan can take advantage of multiple CPU cores in parallel to prepare and optimize the work done by the GPU. This power is not trivial to master, not at all. With Unity, you get the benefits of Vulkan without having to know the specifics of the Vulkan API. We're doing the hard work so you don't have to. Um, seriously, it's easy to use, provides great performance. And then, in sort of new news, um, as of right now, you can get the preview version of Vulkan at the URL right behind me. So with graphics behind us, I want to now take a little bit of a detour through quality and stability. Now, in March, we held off releasing Unity 5.4 and instead released a more stable version of Unity 5.3. Since GDC, we've been heavily focused on stability and quality. And 
I can't tell you how serious we've been. Um, to say we're in focus is an understatement. Now, we promised not to promote product features to a stable release until we got gotten sufficient real-life usage and feedback. And we've changed our engineering processes to deliver on this promise. We embed QA into teams alongside engineers to improve workflow and catch bugs earlier. We create custom experimental builds for features before merging to trunk to minimize the effect on stability. And in 2017, we'll continue that focus. And as we speak today, we're building out a substantial UK test center to really double down on quality and stability and keeping the platform exactly as you want it to be. So now, on to efficiency. We aspire to make our tools more powerful and easy to use. Every release, we make improvements to the editor to make it simpler, more intuitive, more easy to use. Of course, we realize that in addition uh, to making the editor easy to use, we also need to make Unity overall easier to use for teams. Everyone cares about working in teams. Now, we know developers, um, they want to do all sorts of things together, save together, sync together, code together. And we set out to make a tool that makes it easier for the entire team to create together. And as you know, we created Unity Collaborate, and we've been in closed beta. In March, we soft launched the product, and 12,000 developers signed up to use it. That's 3,000 teams banging on it. We've gotten great feedback from developers, storytellers, VR teams. Collaborate has, in fact, made their lives better and easier because it's simple, simple to use. And today, we're making the beta open to all of you here and everyone around the world. But that's not the only thing we're doing to create and connect, you to, uh, to connect developers together across projects and teams. Today, we're announcing an entirely new platform called Unity Connect. And here to talk more about that is our chief people officer, Elizabeth Brown. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I started working at Unity a year and a half ago. We were 500 employees. Today, we're over 1,000. And we've got some of the greatest employees, I'm so proud. Really outstanding talent. So hiring that many employees, man, was that, it was a pain. It was challenging. And I understand a lot of you have those same challenges. In fact, last night I was talking to Sharif from TikTok, and he was sharing the same thing about all the jobs, FYI, TikTok's hiring, all the jobs that they're um, trying to fill. And I gave him a preview of the product that I'm about to show, and he was pumped. He thinks that this is really going to solve a pain point. And if you're an independent developer, I hear it's also tough to connect to some cool projects. I mean, you want that income coming in, right? And you want a cool project to add to your portfolio, and that can be challenging um, to connect to that work. So we totally get it, and we've created a platform called Unity Connect. This is a global community of developers right at your fingertips. You guys are going to love this. So here's how it works. So if you're an independent developer, you go on, build your profile, pick a good photo, um, add in your skills. Make sure you tag all of those good skills, because that's what's going to be searchable and have people find you on the right projects. Include samples of your work, lines of code, whatever. This is your chance to showcase who you are and the kind of work that you want. And then if you're on a studio or a project um, owner and you're looking for talent, you can go ahead and post a task, a project, and then search and filter for precisely those skills and people that you need and get connected to them pretty quickly. Of course, if you're looking to add to your team long term, you can also post a job. Super cool, right? So at 3 o'clock today, I'm hosting a session where we're going to go into a lot more detail. I also have Ann Evans, who heads up recruiting for Unity, joining me, and we're going to share some tips, insights. I think we're getting pretty good at recruiting, and we wanted to offer up some learning. And also, today, it's open beta. So go on and create your profile, create a project, a task, or post a job, and get ready to find and be found. Thank you, and see you at 3. Big applause.
Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. Connect looks and sounds fantastic. Um, now I'd like to turn to the subject of platform growth. Now, there are lots of platforms and technologies on this slide. Seriously, take a look. I, I can't even imagine, or maybe you can't even imagine, platforms that you'd want to support that aren't here. Um, and this year, we've added support, native optimized support, for Amazon Fire OS, Microsoft HoloLens, Google Cardboard and Daydream, and Steam VR. Now, supporting these platforms allowed Unity developers to build and launch games that were downloaded 5 billion times last quarter. Now, look at yourselves out there. That's you. The community of Unity developers developed and launched games that were downloaded 5 billion times last quarter. That's incredible. And that's across 2.4 billion unique devices. And the numbers are up sharply from quarter and year over year. It's amazing what you're achieving. And today, we'll be making several new platform and tech announcements to help you continue to grow on new platforms, because we believe new platforms means a new opportunity. Now, one of these new platforms is something you've heard about, something you've been working on with our great partner from Facebook. And I'd like to welcome onto the stage Leo Olibe to talk more about that. Leo? Great. Awesome. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having us. You know, back in August, we announced to the world that we were partnering with the number one game development platform, Unity, to provide the ability for developers to easily bring their games to Facebook. Now, as you know, Facebook has a global audience of 1.7 billion people. That's a lot of people and a lot of gamers. So as part of that announcement, we told you all about a new destination for gamers to play, a downloadable PC gaming platform. Today, I'm pleased to announce our new platform, and I invite you all to discover a better place to play. Facebook Game Room. So currently available for Windows 7 and up, Game Room allows gamers to easily discover, share, and play the games they love. This is a place where games and gamers across all genres are celebrated. We've built an immersive experience dedicated to gaming, thus allowing developers like yourselves to tap into the massive audience on Facebook. Let's take a look. So the first thing you'll notice, there's game room right there behind me, is that the prominent featuring of new game titles. But we also want to make it easy for people to access their favorite games and browse for new games by category. So we're going to go take a look here. I like role and playing games. Um, and down there, like I think Oz Broken Kingdom looks pretty cool. So all you do is click play now and then click to play. So what does this mean for you as a developer? Well, the way we like to think about this Facebook platform is by way of our build, grow, and monetize framework. For build, this is Unity, the ability to make great games. For grow, we have new tools like hosting and payments to help you um, reach, help you accelerate deployment. Of course, you have the ability to reach gamers on the leading social platform as well, that 1.7 billion people. So for monetize, we've given you the ability to maximize ROI by making it easy to publish cross-platform. At the end of the day, it's really simple. Just remember two things. One, get your game in front of as many people as possible, and two, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for you to do so. So we're excited to announce that Facebook support in Unity will ship as part of Unity 5.6. It's available now in a public developer beta. With this new export functionality in the Unity editor, you will be able to export to both WebGL and Facebook Game Room. For more information, check out our demo tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. or just find us in our booth. Thank you all very much. We look forward to, to seeing you and talking to you. Take care. Thanks, Leo. Now, we love working for Facebook, and I personally think this new Facebook app and platform is going to be a huge success. Now, if you have been paying attention, you look really closely, you'll notice there's a few more logos versus the slide I showed just a few minutes ago. That's because we're making a few more announcements, um, the first of which will help you bring your games to the Chinese market. Now, for those of you that don't know, Xiaomi is an amazing organization. They are gigantic. They're based in China, and they run the largest app store there, the largest Android app store there. And it recently passed, they recently passed the total download mark of 50 billion games and applications. Think about that number. Um, that's multiples of the total world population. They're an amazing organization. And this new platform gives Unity Mobile developers direct access to one of the largest Android app stores in the world and in China. Today, Unity and Xiaomi, we're going to make it easier for you to launch in China. 
Xiaomi can provide the necessary support to get your license, get a license through the Chinese government so you can have the permissions to launch in China, an important and complicated step. And Unity IAP is set up so you can port the assets and the downloadables for your game directly from where you are into the Xiaomi environment. And Unity Ads becomes the only authorized third-party app network within the Xiaomi app, app Store. A new platform and for you, a massive new revenue opportunity. We're very proud of this partnership. Now, we love expanding our platform reach to generate even more success for you or to give you that opportunity. And there is nothing more exciting than the launch of a new platform for Nintendo. I mean, who doesn't love Nintendo, Pokemon, Mario, and decades of amazing games? We're so excited to announce today that we're providing support for Nintendo Switch. There we go. I knew that would be a big one in this group. Now, PTC Euphoria. Today, 80% of Euphoria apps are made with Unity, including lead leading titles from Mattel, Hasbro, Lego, and Activision. And Unity and Euphoria are partnering together on a system optimization to the camera, the rendering pipeline, and a number of things for a more realistic AR effect. Euphoria is available today in the Unity Asset Store. And you've heard a lot about some of these. Oh, hold on. Where's the Viewhoria guys? You're out there somewhere. Anyway, this is available for us today, and you should go out there and take a look. So you've heard a lot from me today about our principles um, guiding us, our four priorities. Um, I've gone as much as we can at a high level. I'd now like to invite to the stage, um, really, someone that you need to know if you don't already. He's our founder. He's our CTO. He's the guy who started all this, and I'm proud to call him a good friend, Joachim Ante. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. At Unity today, we have two big focus areas. John talked a lot about graphics quality. And to achieve high quality graphics, we're focused on those two areas. During the keynote today, we'll show you several awesome demos that are of tools made specifically for artists and animators, because that is a very important initiative for us to really make better tools for artists and animators. Now, secondly, we have a focus on scaling Unity across the board, from optimizing performance to better workflows. Our focus is really on helping you build the highest quality games. Some of those projects are still out in the future, but I want to give you a glimpse into that future of where we're really heading. Now, Unity has always been great at prototyping and iteration time. But when your project gets bigger and lots of assets are in it, then iteration time slows down. So this is what we're very focused on solving now. So our first initiative is our new asset pipeline. Currently. When you import a project folder, Unity will perform the import, show a progress bar, and then you wait. Now, in 2014, we brought you the cancel button to the import bar. <laughs> <laughs> but what we really want to do is we want to remove it completely. So, we decided to completely rewrite our import pipeline. And the main thing that we're doing is we're doing all our asset imports in the background. So basically, when you open a project, you can open it immediately. And it shows up. And then when you actually select an asset or open a scene, then Unity will make sure that the scene and the assets that are used by that scene have already been imported. While all the other assets in your project they are simply importing in the background while you're working. So essentially, we'll make it so that the project import time scales with the assets that you're using as opposed to the assets that are in your whole project folder. And that's, of course, massively more usually. Another thing that we're doing with this new import pipeline is we're making it so that multiple processes are working on importing all these assets together. So that means they run in parallel and thus a full project import becomes much faster. So 
this is quite central tech in Unity in order to really push Unity to the next level. It's still a while out in the future, but we're making very good progress on this. Now, a second topic is um, in the editor, we have always had great iteration times. But of course, there are situations where you actually want to deploy to a device and do that again and again and again. And you want to do it quickly. So today, Unity builds the executable, builds all your assets, builds all your scripts, and then you upload it to a device. And of course, that can be very time consuming. So particularly on mobile VR platforms, it is very important to have a very quick and fast iteration time when testing on the device. And so we're working on a feature that is basically a hot reload feature where the standalone player instead, it simply pulls the data, it pulls the script code, it pulls the assets when they change. So that means the iteration time gets much, much faster. So that's really important for iterating quickly, especially in the last couple, um, in the last phase of your project. Additionally, we have also a team that is looking at optimizing load times in general. I think that's very much a, 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 that's a really important area for us to focus on. Now, when shipping your game, one thing that you always want more of is, of course, performance. In particular, the biggest gains we can get in Unity is all about getting to 100% multi-core utilization. Over the last two years, we have already put quite a bit of work into multi-threading parts of the engine, in particular rendering. So as you can see here, this is a stress test Viking village scene that we made. And in 5.3, we had um, basically our render loops were running on the main thread. So that is the code that basically figures out which renders to render, how to sort them, um, and what state to set for each rendered object. But you can also see that actually the thread that then submits all these draw calls to the native graphics API, that is the render thread, the second bar there. And that one is actually, um, is actually also a bottleneck. And so what we did in Unity 5.4 with the, render, uh, with the um, uh, re rendering jobs is we made it so that the work which is done on the main thread, the render jobs, can be distributed to the worker threads. So you can see the main thread CPU consumption goes all the way down. But what happens is that the, the CPU consumption on the render thread goes all the way up. And it's really the bottleneck now. So what it means is that Overall, in this particular game, it's only a 20% increase. C-sharp game code can run and do work in parallel on the main thread, of course. So that's the big improvement, that you basically have all this free time to basically run your game code. And now, what we have been busy now, particularly on the PS4 team, they are the first team that has, uh, that has shipped this, is um, we have been adding support for native render jobs. And what that means is it's an API where we can directly from our jobs talk to the native graphics API. And that means the render, the, render, the render thread itself, basically all the work it does, gets distributed to all the worker threads. And now you can see here the, the multi-core utilization really goes all the way up and it's really well distributed and the main thread has even less work to do. And so you can put a lot more stuff on the main thread and overall, this gives us a 2.5x speed improvement. Yeah. So the next step is bringing that to a lot more platforms. Now, making graphics faster is always a big win. But there's, of course, a lot more a lot of other engine code in Unity that's not particularly related to graphics. For example, all of our simulation code. For example, animation systems, NuffMesh system, physics systems, they all 
get and set transform values, and they all change the positions of your characters and all these things. And so for a long time, multi-threading these subsystems was very difficult for us because the transform component itself wasn't able to be, uh, to be accessed from this job safely. And so we have rewritten our transform component from scratch, and we built it in a way so that it can be safely written and read from, uh, from a job. And in this rewrite, we also optimize the transform component quite a bit. So even when you use it on the main thread, which is what you usually do when you write script code, um, it is much faster. So here, we have a stress test where we basically have 10,000 um, mesh renders, separate mesh renders, and then we call transform.position on 10,000 mesh renders every frame. So we just move a bunch of objects around. And so you can see here, the performance to get and set the position on an Xbox One goes from 9.1 milliseconds to 5.9 milliseconds. And of course, after moving all these game objects in your C Sharp code, we have to update all the bounding volumes and start kicking them off to the rendering. And to do that, we have new code which recalculates the bounding volumes. And that code has gone from 11.5 milliseconds to 2.3. So combined, that's roughly a 2.5x speed up for common operation that you will do in your game code. So that's, yeah. <laughs> so, that's, so that's huge. So with that, I would like to show you a little demo that we built. So in this demo here, we have uh, 2,000 fish swimming around performing old school boil simulation. So all the simulation code is written in C-sharp. Each fish has its own behavior with separation, alignment, and attraction. And they all interact with each other in quite realistic ways, ways in this swarm. So each fish is also represented by a separate game object with a full mesh render. So there's a transform component and a script driving it. Now, let's take a look what happens when we add uh, 20,000 fish. All right, there you go. There's 20,000 fish. OK, and you can see that, of course, runs uh, pretty slow. I mean, that wouldn't be acceptable to ship in a game with that framework. Fortunately, we've been working on a new system, our c -sharp job system. And let's turn that on. There you go. So as you can see, the frame rate immediately snaps back to a solid 30, 40 FPS. And it's very smooth. With our job system, you can write C sharp code that can perform computation tasks, which is run on all your cores. So the simulation runs eight times faster on this particular machine. Now, when writing multi threaded code, there's usually one big problem writing deterministic code, multi threaded code, making it not crash or randomly override some memory is really, really hard. I've certainly spent my share of sleepless nights debugging my own or other people's multi-threading, multi-threaded code in C++. And it's, it's pretty painful. It's not fun. They're really the hardest types of bugs to track down. And in Unity, I think of Unity as a safe sandbox where you can simply write code, assemble your assets, and experiment quickly and Unity gives you automatically easy to understand error messages when you're doing something incorrectly. So that's exactly what we have brought to the, to the C-sharp job system. We have built a job debugging system into the editor that detects any possible race condition and essentially gives you a framework that helps you find any race condition right away, makes it simple for you to create safe and efficient multi-threaded code. And it's very deeply integrated into Unity. Because in this example, for in, in, thi in, this, in this demo here, for example, we have 20,000 complete game objects with mesh renders and everything. And every frame, we perform a full simulation step. And we set the transform position from a C-sharp job on our job system. 
and it all works completely safely and deterministically. So, I mean, I've seen this demo a couple times, but it still blows my mind that that is actually even possible, getting both the performance and the safety. It's like, um, it's like having your cake and eating it too. So I'm, I'm really excited about all the new tech that we're working on at, in Unity at the moment. It very much feels like we're at an inflection point right now where the engine is about to really scale up to the next level and allow you to build far more ambitious projects. So on that note, I'd like to bring up to the stage Brad McQuaid, and Corey Lefevre of the Visionary Realms to give us a demonstration of their awesome new MMO RPG. Hey. Hello, everyone. Thanks to Unity for the, uh, this opportunity and a huge shout out to our community for all the support. Today, it's my honor to give you all a sneak peek of Pantheon, Rise of the Fallen. Pantheon is a modern, high fantasy, massively multiplayer online game. In recent years, development budgets for MMOs have skyrocketed in the tens, even hundreds of millions of dollars. Our startup studio, Visionary Realms, thanks in a large part to tools like Unity, is developing Pantheon for a fraction of the cost and with a smaller, leaner, meaner team. With the current team size of 15 developers, we plan to peak at around 40. What you see in front of you is actual gameplay and a working, stable client we have built with seed funding and a community support. And the server is running on the cloud. Let me tell you how this is possible while Corey takes us on a quick tour of Avenger's Pass, a region players will start adventuring in fairly early in the game. With tools like Unity available to us, the entire process of building an MMO has become measurably more efficient. Take a look at the graphics you are seeing here. This is a detailed and epic world, and even though the final R pass has yet to be done, you can already see the quality and the depth of the visuals. To say the least, we're, we're very happy with the results. In the early days of making MMOs, we had to license an engine to make the game. Typically, the engine was designed for, for first-person shooters, and we would have to spend a significant time and resources modifying it to get it to work for an MMO. With Unity, those days are over. With its efficiency, ease of use, the Unity Store, and C Sharp, we were able to jump right into building the game. And it's important to note that we did not even have this luxury even a few years ago. This kind of simplicity in development, however, doesn't mean you need to sacrifice content or quality. As empowering as Unity is to teams with only a handful of people to make fun and engaging smaller games, it is equally empowering for large projects where experienced developers can leverage its capabilities in a rich library of plugins to create massive worlds. Worlds filled with thousands of players, NPCs, stories, and secrets spread across many environments. Let's turn our attention back to the screen as it looks like Corey has found a cave and is about to explore a new zone himself. These are the caves of Halner. This dark and dangerous dungeon was created by our development team in a relatively short time span. This then gave our designers and programmers plenty of time to focus on game mechanics, things like combat, AI, and our own brand of questing, the perception system. Because we've not needed to fumble around with repurposing an engine, we've, we've been able to create functional zones like Halner Caves, and instead of piecing together a vertical slice or demoware, we built actual game features to showcase our, to our crowdfunding community as well as our potential investors and publishers. This has provided us a stable and demonstrable client to get us essential feedback from interested parties. And what about our audience? Because the game is stable and playable at its current internal pre-alpha state with a fully functional game world, We've been able to stream live gameplay to our enthusiastic community, a community that already numbers into the tens of thousands. We have been able to host Let's Plays while the game is still under development, which not only gives, helps us get the word out, but also gives us a platform to show our valued pledges what we have accomplished. Thank you, Pantheon community. You guys are amazing. Thanks. 
As our audience continues to widen, we are keenly aware that there is a demand for Pantheon to be released on several platforms. Although we cannot confirm multiple platforms for launch, we can say that Unity's ability to easily compile for many platforms certainly makes that option much more likely. With the cloud-hosted server farm and Unity's networking technology, our early client of Pantheon fully supports global connectivity. You are seeing players on screen right now who are logged in from Australia, the UK, the East Coast, and here in California. They are online, grouping up, and playing together even as the game is being built. This is stability. This is independent development in 2016. We're out of time here, but we wanted to let you know we'll be doing a third full-length Twitch, uh, Twitch stream in the near future and revealing a lot more. Please come and find me during a break if you want to talk more about Pantheon, funding, or MMOs in general. Now, more than ever, the tools for making great games are available to everyone. A small team doesn't mean small ideas are limiting your imagination. I encourage you all to push onward and upward. Don't ever assume you can't make your dreams come true. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brad. Hey, everyone. I hope you all survived yesterday's uh, Halloween parties and can stick with us for these demos because we have a lot of demos to run through. So the next version of Unity that we're going to ship is 5.5. We've been cooking on it for quite some time already. And as usual, you can get the latest beta version from our website today. We're going to dive straight into the demos. Actually, first, I'm going to say that we're going to look at a few demos that show what Unity 5.5 can do right now. And we'll also have a few demos that look a bit more into the future to see some of the things that will coming, be coming down the pipe later on. So we're going to dive straight into the demos now. We're going to start with the demo from Philip Eliescu who works at Unity to support our Apple platforms to talk about the state of metal rendering in Unity today. Are you, Philip? There you go. Thank you, Lucas. Hi, everybody. I'm Philip Ilyescu, and I help our Unity developers be successful with our platform partners. Now, I'm super excited to be here to share this update on metal within Unity. As John mentioned earlier, mobile graphics are top priority for Unity. So we're pushing really hard to bring you the best mobile graphics engine in the world. Now, at WWDC this last year, we showed this demo of metal tessellation running with compute and native metal shaders. Today, I'm going to show you a new demo and talk a little bit about how we're planning to roll all these features out. Let's pop over to the demo machine here. All right. So, so starting in Unity 5.5, we've upgraded our shader cross compiler, which um, opens the door for many advanced graphics features and instancing in native metal shaders. Uh, so here we have uh, this demo running. And you can see with instancing, uh, not enabled, it's running at about uh, you know, two or three frames per second. It's running very slow. But the minute we turn on instancing, we'll see the performance dramatically increase. Now, instancing is the case where you're running many similar uh, game objects with only a single draw call. So, Essentially, what we have here is about 12,000 asteroids. You know, it's, uh, you know we've, we've, we've sped it up to about 30 frames per second. And um, for those of you not familiar with instancing, basically, we're rendering a lot more objects here. And each, each asteroid is animating independently with its own color variation. And they receive and cast shadows on each other. Notice that this would not be possible with just batching the asteroids together. Now, I have just one more thing to share with you here, so I'm going to switch over to the Mac. OK. Here we are in a preview build of Unity. And notice 
it's running metal. So that means that you can get instant feedback on anything that you might be doing before you deploy to device. So real quick, instancing is very easy to enable. You can simply enable, uh, you know, change some, uh, change the shader on the game object that you want to enable. Uh, you know, one line of code in the shader. Very simple. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit play and just show you some of the things that uh, you can do here. Very simply, you know, you can sort of adjust the number of asteroids and see that instantaneously. You, know, you can pop over to the camera. You know, there's a lot of things you can do and just get immediate feedback before you actually deploy the device. I think it's going to be a huge win for people and just really save a lot of time. You know, we're really excited to launch this more complete workflow for Metal where you can immediately see your modifications to, the compute, to your compute shaders, post effects, native Metal shaders, or any game experience targeting any Metal device. To get early access to these features, make sure you join our beta groups and forums and watch for announcements. So let's switch back to slides for just one second. I wanted to bring up this, uh, this timeline here to show you sort of how we're planning on rolling these features out in Unity. In 5.5, we've upgraded our shader cross-compiler, which basically opened up the door for instancing and native metal shaders. And it also opened up the door for compute in Unity 5.6. Later in 2017, we'll bring you Tessellation and the editor as well. But that's the, that's the timeline. That's what, that's what we have to look forward to. So yes, please join our beta groups and uh, keep, keep apprised of announcements. Thank you very much. Thanks. Philip. So over the last two years, Unity's graphics capabilities have really been taken up, you know, to, to another level. But you know, what good is all this graphics performance and render, you know, rendering capabilities if you don't have great content to use it for? So a new area that we're going to spend a lot of energy on, on at Unity and have already been putting a lot of effort in so far is artist tooling. Now, artists from the movie industry, they are used to, you know, they have to their availability a a wide range of really amazing tools to help them output their creativity. But if an ambitious artist from the game world tries to use some of these movie tools, they quickly run into the problem that there's no convenient pipeline between the two. That in games, you know, you need to do things slightly differently, and these tools don't, you know, they don't help you with that very well. So we've been working on a tool that, will, that attempts to bridge that gap, and I will show you it in a demo right now. So, Right here, I have my uh, Vikings, uh, Viking Village demo, and I have a particle system here. And what I want to do is I want to sp spice up the smoke animation. Now, a tool that's very popular in the movie and VFX industry is a tool called Houdini. And we've used Houdini to create an explosion animation here. You can see it here. It has all these frames. And this is actually already the point where you run into a problem that you know, in games, you want to do things slightly differently than in movies because if you want to render an animation like this efficiently in a real-time engine like Unity, you want to have all these frames in a single texture sheet. So we've made a tool that, uh, that should help with that. And let me show you how it works. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go create VFX Toolbox Image Sequence. I'm going to double-click it. I'm just going to throw my explosion folder on there. I'm going to hit play to see what it looks like. Oh, let me go back to color mode. So this is the animation. And I can go to processes here, and I can add a processor and go to assemble flipbook. And what it will do is it will give me this 5 by 5 texture sheet of the animation. Now, the original animation, it was actually much longer. And you can see that because the, we only have the first 25 frames with the fire and none with the smoke. So instead of having to go back to Houdini and do another time-consuming export, the, we made this tool so that you can fix that in Unity right here. So let me go to the processors again, and let me add a re read time processor at the top. And I'm going to tell it that instead of whatever frames I have now, I want to have 25 frames, and I don't want to use this curve thing here. 
If I now go back to the flipbook, you can see that now it has, it has resampled the whole animation so that the whole thing fits into these 25 frames. Okay, so let's take a look. Oh, actually notice that it's 2K by 2K here. Another thing that's slightly different in games, because in games we like things to be power of two. So let me add a resize processor at the end here to just turn this guy into a 124 by 124 texture. And you know, when I like it here, I'm going to go to export and hit export as new. And we'll call it thick smoke. And it creates this texture for me right here. So let's see what this looks like in the, in the scene. So I'm going to go back to my particle system. I'm going to tell the particle system to use this new texture, which is going to look super weird because we haven't told the particle system that this is an animation. So let's do that and turn it on like that. So since all these demos that go very choppy in the beginning and then smooth get all this uh, applause, uh, I've made one too. <laughs> Well, let, let's let's wait till I you know let's let's wait and see if I can actually get it to be non-choppy before you yeah, start with the applause. So typically, what you would have to do now you know is go back to your authoring package and do a re-export because these 25 frames it turned out to really be you know too aggressive. May, you know we need maybe 50 or 60 or 70. However, we can do that in the image sequencer here. Uh, so I'll just go back to the pro to the processors and to the read time. I'm going to tell it that I want 64 frames instead of 25. And then at the flipbook, I'm going to say that I want to have an 8x8. Eight eight. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm sacrificing resolution per frame in the texture sheet in order to be able to stuff more frames into my texture sheet. You know, it's a pretty, like, you always have to find a balance between these two. But it's still a little bit sad that we lose that resolution, especially because when you turn on the alpha here, you can see that we're doing a really bad job at efficiently using the texture space, which we actually pay for twice, because both, you both have this wasted texture space, and you also pay for the overdraw when you actually uh, render it. So again, same story. Instead of having to go back to Houdini, we can do this here in the tool. I can get a crop uh, processor. Here it is. And I'll put it over here. I'm going to find a frame that's sort of the biggest one that still needs to fit. Let me enlarge that a little bit. So I think the largest frame is kind of this one. So I'm going to give it a much tighter fit now. I'm going to crop it to the top and the bottom, and the left and the right. I've done this so many times. I've become an expert cropper. <laughs> if you, if I'll, I'll go to Unity Connect, actually, and sign up. And uh, have like <laughs> have cropping be as one of my core competencies. If you ever need a cropper, you know where to find me. Um, so I think all the frames fit quite well into this. Oh, look at that one! It gets a little bit cut off. Let me let me ease up on that a little bit. Okay. So now I go back to the bottom one, and you can see that we have a much more efficient. Texture, uh, texture utilization, so some of the resolution that we had to sacrifice to get these 64 frames, we've been able to win it back. Okay, so uh, now that I like it, I'm going to go back to export and just hit update, which is going to override the same texture as before. I'm going to take a look in the scene view and beware because it's going to be all screwy again because the particle system still thinks this is a 5x5 five five thing. So let's tell it that it's an 8x8 eight eight one, and there you go. It's much smoother and looks, you know, looks pretty good. <laughs> Maybe I should have made it even more choppy in the beginning for, <laughs> for like the punch. <laughs> All right, so I'm happy to announce that this tool, which we're calling Image Sequencer, uh, you can already get the first preview build of it today at unity3d.com slash experimental. So please go download it, try it, and tell us what you think. It needs, I think it needs Unity 5.5 Beta 7 for it to work. Um, and we're ha very happy that we've been able to, uh, you know, to get that into your hands today. Now, another area where artists in the movie industry have been way ahead of what you can do in games is post-processing. And at Unity, we've been, had a post-processing team that's for the last year been working to create a new post-processing stack that's fast and, and really powerful. 
and we took a very good look at the tools that people in the movie industry use to make sure that all these controls and all this experience of how to do really kick-ass posts like color correction, tone mapping, to bring those same kind of controls that artists in the movie industry are used to, to bring those to Unity. So we're, for our next demo, we're going we're gonna to get a demo from, Ed, from Matt Dean, who works on Unity's post-processing team, to take a look at all the stuff in Unity's post-processor stack. Take it away, Matt. Do you need Thank slide? You, Lucas. Oh, you don't, right? Hello, everyone. So this last year, we've been working on a completely new range of image effects to help make your products look their best. As we closed in on a complete set, we started looking at the next step. So that's what I'm here to show you, our new post-processing stack. We've combined the full set of individual effects into an easy-to-configure, asset-driven workflow. What used to take at least one full-screen pass per effect now takes significantly fewer passes. So post-processing is now faster and easier than ever before. Of course, we also have some new and improved effects to show you. So I'm going to start with improved chromatic aberration, eye adaptation, brand new depth of field, and improved bloom with lens dirt. But that's just the beginning. So let's dive into a scene and have a look at a proper use case. Here we have a scene from ArchViz Pro Volume 3 from the Asset Store. And we're just going to have a look at applying some post-processing to this. First, we're going to take a look at our color grading. Let's say our artist had gone in and made some changes to this that we didn't really like. And maybe we'd have something that looked a little bit like this. This problem is really easy to fix with post-processing. So the first thing we're going to look at is the scene's luminance. To do this, we're going to use a monitor called the histogram. The first thing you're going to notice is that all of our values are right up in the top end of the histogram, meaning our scene is way too bright. We can fix this easily by adjusting white levels to push everything back into the range, adjust the black in and out. So just rebalance our scene and get a nice exposure. The next thing we would have to look at is the color. To look at this, we're going to use the vector scope. The vector scope is a circular diagram that represents all of the hues that could be found within our scene. The exterior of the vector scope is higher saturated values, and the center is monochromatics. As you can see from the vector scope and the game view, we have a pretty heavy green tint here. So I'm going to fix this using our log trackballs. As I adjust the trackball, you can see the black areas that represent the hues that can be found within our current camera view realign themselves towards neutral, and we fixed our tinting simply. The next thing I want to show you is our brand new depth of field. As you can see, it uses realistic camera controls, which make it really intuitive. If I turn on our focus plane debug, you can easily see our focal point and the width of our aperture. If I narrow our aperture, it's very simple for me to adjust our focal point. I can then rewiden, disable the debug, and just adjust to taste. That's how simple our new depth of field is to use. Moving on, I'd like to talk about edge quality. Here you can see that without any form of anti-aliasing, we have some pretty jagged edges. However, if I use our new temporal anti-aliasing, you can see that not only are our edges smoothed out, but this is lightning fast. We've tested our new TAA 
on PS4 at 1080p, and it comes in at under a millisecond. The great thing about TAA is that under movement, because it collects all of our frames in a history buffer, it keeps all of our edges smooth, even in motion. At this point, I'm just going to start throwing on some other effects. And once we're happy with our color grading and all of our effects, we can move on to the next step. Because this is an asset-based system, we can easily apply the same post-processing to multiple cameras. At this point, I could adjust any of our values in our post-processing, and it would update in real time, in play mode, on all of the cameras that it was assigned to. If I disable our post, we can see just how much difference this makes. Just like we can use the same post-processing on multiple cameras, we can also easily switch between different post-processing on the same cameras. And there we have it. Simple to use, industry standard post-processing in Unity today. Thank you. Woo! Thanks, Matt. I love it. Actually, one of the great things about this post-processing stack is that it's open source. It's a bunch of C-sharp scripts and shaders. And we're actually nearing the end of our beta phase. And you can get the bits from our GitHub today to use this stack to up the level of the graphics in your game to a new level. Can you say that, up a level to a new level? I don't think so. Um, actually, the I'm sure they'll hate me say it, but I'm super proud of what Unity's post-processing team has been able to achieve for our customers this year. We really like the, it's, you know, it's really an amazing improvement in graphics for Unity in this past year, and we're really hoping that you'll use it to, to improve your graphics. Um, if there's one area in particular that we are very aware that we have some work to do to earn that artist's love, it's the area of light mapping. I <laughs> um, guess that's applause for, from some people with scars. <laughs> so we've been at work at adding much more artist workflow friendly light mapping tech to Unity. And as usual, when we develop these kind of features, we make sure that very early in development, we, we include a bunch of early teams to use the feature to make sure you know, that we're doing the right thing, to tell us if we're actually solving the right problem, if we're going into the right direction. And one of the teams that's been helping us you know, find the direction for this light mapper is here with us today. And they're going to show us a demo of what the light mapper can do, how it works, and how it has changed their art workflow. So please help me welcome to the stage Juan Martinez from Playful Core. Hey, Juan. Do you need the clicker? Yeah. There you go. Hi, everybody. At Playful, it's our passion to create fun and cutting edge games. Our first game was Lucky's Tale. And people really loved Lucky's immersive and happy world. But when we were making that world, lighting, light baking was a huge bottleneck. So I'm really happy to show you the new progressive light mapper uh, and to give you a sneak peek at what we have cooking over at Playful. So this is a new scene we have in development. To enable the new progressive light mapper in the lighting panel, turn on Bake GI and pick progressive from the Bake Backend dropdown. I'm going to turn on auto mode, and let's focus on this small section over here. So progressive rendering is at the heart of the new lighting engine. The longer we look at this scene, the progressively better the render is going to get. Uh, let's say, let's pretend I forgot to enable my main directional light. So usually, this would cost you several hours of re-render time. But as I enable and disable the light, see how the viewport instantly updates and starts progressively rendering again. Ah. <laughs> okay. 
So my favorite new feature, though, is prioritize view. And notice as I, oops, as I rotate the camera around, whatever I start looking at is what takes priority in the render. So anywhere you focus will start rendering right away. In many ways, this is better than the old bake selected option. So I know what you're thinking. Progressive rendering works great if I'm looking at a small part of the level. So let's take a bird's eye view. And I'll open the light maps tab. So notice as I rotate the main directional light around, the entire level instantly starts rebaking. Any changes you make to a bake light, color, intensity, and bounce, will automatically start rebaking, and it'll give you a really good idea of the final output. And I also think it's really cool to see the light map textures generating in real time. I'm going to turn off auto mode and clear my current bake, and then hit the build button. So let's say that you need to make a build right now. You've been rendering for a little bit, and you're really happy with how it looks. The new force stop button lets you stop the bake, save the current progress to disk, and you can make your build. And then when you continue baking, it'll pick up right where it left off. Another great feature is the new ETA in the bottom right corner of the screen. <laughs> yeah. So previously, we'd wait for several progress bars to finish, but you didn't really have a clear idea of how much time the bake had left. Here, we can see we have about 24 seconds for this entire level to finish baking. But before it's done, let's open up the baked lighting view, and I'll head over to this small section over here. So this is, a, a, this is an area of a bunch of complex intersecting objects. What's really great about the progressive light mapper is it doesn't need a third UV channel, and it doesn't break your model up into extra UV charts. So you can expect to see fewer seams and fewer shading artifacts. So the bake's done. I did time that really well, actually. So I'll go into play mode now. All the, all the lighting options are either in the uh, lighting panel or on the lights themselves. With such a sh small learning curve, anybody on your team can do lighting. So let's take a look around. I think for just a couple minutes of baking that, that this looks really good. So with iterative tools like progressive rendering, prioritize view, force stop, and the new ETA, it makes doing lighting fun and playful. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. Thanks, Juan. And thanks for all the early feedback on our builds. So the light mapping team is not quite ready yet to push out the first preview build. But when they do, it's going to arrive at the same URL, unity3d.com slash experimental. So please keep a lookout for it so that when we ship the first bits, you can get your hands on it. So we're going to. Um, uh, we're going to take a break for demos for a moment because we're going to put a Mate with Unity game in the spotlight. This is a game from a Korean developer, Gameville, and with us here today to talk, us, to talk about it is Q Lee. Oh, hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Q Lee from Gameville USA. Today, I would like to talk about making a mobile MMORPG with Unity. I'll first explain how we decided to develop an MMORPG for mobile, and we'll then reveal the details of the development process. Unlike the Western territories, hardcore gaming is a dominant category in Asia. Asia is one of the fastest growing mobile markets in the world. Nowadays, MMORPGs are becoming a huge trend in countries like Korea and China. As a result, many companies are investing heavily to either create original blockbuster titles 
or develop AAA games based on existing popular IPs in order to become a leader in the category. We believe 2017 will truly be the year where high-budget AAA games will fundamentally change the market dynamics in Asia. Gameville noticed this particular trend and started investing in a mobile MMORPG since 2014. Although mobile MMORPGs are currently popular mainly in Asia, we believe this trend will follow in the West too. With this potential outcome in mind, Royal Blood is being developed to be successful globally. Royal Blood's story is about an heir to a kingdom that was demolished by the evil tribe called the Banished. The hero begins his journey in order to seek revenge, but soon discovers his true destiny and instead fights to save the world. There are four different classes, which are the warrior, the gunner, the wizard, and the muse. Players can cooperate in dynamically created events or fight for their realms in large-scale realm versus realm battles. Of course, the biggest challenge for us was creating a large amount of art resources using a limited amount of assets. For example, we could create many variations of creatures by shifting hues. Also, we created an environment controller which enabled the artist to create various environments easily. Finally, we modified a lot of functions that Unity provides, such as light map, reflection, fog, and sky colors. We made many tools so that a game designer could create new content even without the help of a programmer. Here, we'd like to showcase our creature and event, uh, creature tool and event tool. Creature tool was made node-based. As you see here. Also, by using um, Using Unity's mechanism and overrider, we could process animations with a lot of flexibility. The event tool was developed with content creation speed in mind. Each creator could create a simultaneous scene per person at the same time. With this tool, you could also set the location of the event resource, the logic, and also the animations for the cutscenes. I hope this information was, uh, uh, we shared today was helpful. We're planning to launch Royal Blood next year and hope it will become a huge success like our sister companies come to us as Summoner's War. We hope you enjoy the game once it is released. Thank you. Thanks, Q. Thanks, Q. That looks really good. So, when we were looking for problems to help artists with, are you sensing a theme, by the way, with the artists? Artists, is that message coming across? So while we're looking for, you know, looking for problems that artists in Unity have that we could help them with, one of the things that you know, sticks out is that it's kind of hard in Unity to orchestrate different things happening in your scene over time. You know, it's easy to, to script something like when you hit a, hit a brick against the wall then an explosion should happen, but things like I want the camera to move there and then three seconds later audio to start and then I want to do a fade in and then this dude should walk in, stuff like that is not super easy to do. And I'm very happy that today I'm about to show the solution we've been working on to make that easier. And we call it Timeline. Today, we're going to see two demos of Timeline. And the first one it will be done by Adam Myhill. Adam has, for the last 10 or 15 years, been obsessed by cameras. And Adam joined Unity to bring his experience in this area to our team. 
He's, he's written a really cool procedural camera system in C-sharp, and he's been able to take that camera system and plug it on top of the public timeline API. So let's see how he uses timeline to drive his cameras. Thanks, Lucas. Hey, Adam. Thanks, Lucas. What's up? So timeline, we've been waiting for this, right? Timeline has the standard features you'd expect from a, a sequencer, like it supports animation, of course, and audio, and it has uh, auto keyframing and a multi-track interface with the ability to lock and mute tracks, all that good stuff. And a lot of in, uh, time has been spent on this because we know if you're making cutscenes, you're going to be in this thing for like hours, weeks, months. So it has to feel right. Um, Timeline lets you support the ability to create your own tracks, and this is what's really cool about it. You can create your own tracks, you can create your own clips, and you can control them all from the interface of Timeline. And because they are their own clips, you get like the, the benefit of Timeline's interface. You can blend them, you can extend the clips, you can repeat tracks, and you can control practically anything you, got, you have in your game. You can get this all for free. It's like the choreography of multiple elements, your game elements in Timeline. So when I started doing cutscenes, this was a long time ago, I had, uh, I was really frustrated because you're, you're building these, these big cutscenes and you lay out like hundreds of camera, cut, uh, camera keyframes and you get the scene all set up and it looks good and then you go home and you come back the next day and it's broken. You know, an animator's changed an animation and your cameras just don't work with it. So we decided to fix this problem. We made this thing called Sin Machine and I'm going to show you this today. And what's cool, because of the open architecture of Timeline, we're controlling this thing that we made that we didn't even know about Timeline at the time. And we're all controlling it with Timeline um, because it's completely open. So look at this. It works like you are a director directing a camera operator. You say, hey, shoot this, this shot. I want the guy to be on the left. You can see that we're tracking his eye. And you can change the composition. You can say, no, let's move him over a little bit more. You can move the camera. The cameras follow your direction. So, so there's no keyframing at all in here? There's no keyframing at all. And what you do is you, you give the cameras intent, and then they follow the scene and they shoot the scene appropriately. So let's blow this open. Let's get this bigger. We're going to run the scene. You can see here, these are all shots. And what we're doing with Timeline is we're just blending the notion of shots. We're just saying, this is a shot idea. Compose it this way. This is another shot idea, compose it this way. And you can cut or you can blend. And we're doing all this in timeline. This is a massive blend just between two different shots. But the animations, the FOV blending, the positional blending, you get it all for free with, with the, the timeline interface. So are all these clips, they're all procedural cameras? They're all procedural cameras. There's not a single keyframe. Look at this. So you can just see, this is a wide shot. Also notice this little procedural handheld noise. That's all tunable. So we get this wide shot, and he's doing whatever. Not super exciting. We see his animation. Cool, we got a cut coming up. We cut. But with Timeline, and this will happen with anything that you make in Timeline, you get the benefit of the, this interface. Watch this. We drag it over top. Now, what was a cut turns into a push. And it blends everything. So this is an entirely new way of making cutscenes where you can go away and they can change a character model, they can change an animation, and you come back. And I'm not saying it's 100% bug resistant, but it's probably going to be OK. <laughs> and the cool thing is you just like it's fun to work, and you're like, oh, that happened a little bit too soon. So why don't we just drag that blend a little bit later while the game's running? It saves all this stuff, even you're in edit mode. And you just work very. You work very artfully in this. You work like you're a camera operator or a director versus keyframing cameras. It's not fragile. Hey, and when we ship Timeline, are we going to make these cameras available somehow? Yeah, it'll be as a Unity uh, package, uh, free on the Asset Store. And we'd like to show you more about Timeline. We have a talk on Wednesday at 3.30. So please come check it out. We show you so much more than just this. Uh, thanks, Adam. Really Cheers. cool. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> So yeah, Timeline is our solution to, you know, to help it, to make it easier to drive scenes and to do cinematic storytelling from Unity. Now, just as with the light mapper, very early on in the Timeline development, we've, we got a few teams into the development process very early to make sure that we're on the right track. 
And actually, one of those teams was the team that made the Atom demo. So the Atom demo was built on top of an early version of Timeline. Now, when we showed this early build of Timeline around, a lot of the time we got feedback saying like, hey, have you guys ever thought about using Timeline or any of Unity's other features to do something other than games? You know, to maybe make non-interactive content, maybe for cartoons or TV or even movies. Now, as it turns out, if there's one company here in LA that knows a thing or two about the TV and the movie industry, it's a company called Otoy. Otoy has a renderer that's called Octane that's used in the TV and movie industry a lot. And for this next demo, we're going to take a look how Otoy uses Timeline to drive some of their content. And to do that, I'd like to invite on stage Jules Orbach from Otoy. Oh, thank you. Hey, Jules. Thank you, Lucas. Do this. It is a tremendous pleasure to be here today at Unite and to show the amazing stuff we've been doing with Unity. Um, I'd like to start, though, by talking a little bit about what Otoy does. Um, we are really well known in the visual effects industry. We won an Academy Award uh, for our work on Benjamin Button and Avatar. And uh, our software, Octane Render, is used all across film and TV. And I want to show a recent example, one of my favorite, the opening to Westworld. Let's roll that clip. Now, that gorgeous clip was done on a, uh, in Cinema 4D with Octane on just a few GPUs. And uh, Octane is really fundamental to transforming workflows and getting cinematic quality uh, to happen in real time uh, for artists. I want to show another clip, an original piece of content uh, created by a friend and close collaborator, Big Lazy Robot. This is Keloid. Let's roll that clip. So 1,996 people disaster service on the Russia Gorgeous, right? And when people see Keloid, they wonder, you know, what parts were filmed, what parts were CG. All of it is rendered. All of it is CG. And wouldn't it be amazing if something like this could be rendered in Unity? Yeah, it would Back be really cool if I'd like have that scene open here, right? Yeah, let's do it. Let's show them. Let's show them Keloid in the Unity Editor live. So here's that shot. Isn't that gorgeous? There it is in the Unity Editor. Octane fully integrated in Unity. Timeline fully integrated with Octane. And look, you added, you added Adam in there. Um, what we're showing here is more than just Octane Render in Unity. It's basically transforming the entire way that Timeline works by allowing you to import anything. You can drop in uh, scenes from Master Maya or Unity. You can also pull in um, any cinematic format, such as OpenVDB volumes. Now those can be primitives inside of Unity. Let's add, there we go, a fire volume. And uh, even simple things from the Unity Asset Store, uh, like this model, can be dropped in uh, to Timeline and be rendered with cinematic fidelity. And it just looks gorgeous because Octane's a beautiful renderer. And you have this built in. This is all just running on a local machine. It's absolutely amazing to think about the kind of rendering power that we're going to be able to give to people through this collaboration. So I'm really excited to announce how we're going to be giving this to the world. Uh, next year, Octane Render and Orbex will be built in to Unity, all editions for free. It'll be shipping to 6.5 million artists. And we think that the future of cinematic rendering is going to be full, you know, fundamentally transformed by this collaboration. Uh, and we really think that the future is very bright. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what that also means for media that's generated with, uh, with Octane and Unity. Uh, when you generate these VR renders, uh, these cinematic scenes, they can be exported into Orbex media format. Um, those, uh, those renders can actually be published to the cloud, and they can be played back at absolutely incredible fidelity, 18K on the Gear VR. Here are some samples of uh, Adam in the keloid scene. And I want to show a video of this running live in Orbex Media Player, which showcases the scene we just had loaded in the Unity Editor, um, playing back as a VR film. So there's Keloid running at 18K on the Gear VR. And in fact, if you go to the Unity booth, you'll be able to experience this on the Gear VR. And we're publishing these scenes uh, live right at, the, uh, right at the end of this keynote. 
and you'll be able to experience them in a number of different places uh, in VR. Isn't that amazing? Uh, the last part that we're showing here is uh, light field render. So you have, with position tracking, you'll be able to move your head through these scenes uh, as they're playing back. And uh, this content will, will be supported uh, in Oculus Social, in the Samsung Internet Browser, and Oculus 360 Photos. Wow. Thanks, Jules. Thank you. There you go. Thank you very much. Really, like, really, really cool. I'll let me summarize that a little bit because the first time I heard it, it took me a while to it took me a while to get it. So the octane render that you just saw that rendered that movie that I wondered if it was a movie or computer generated, and the next you know the next thing I saw was having that scene open in the Unity editor and driving it with a timeline, and even. You know, I even like that, that frog model or whatever it was that I just got from the SS store, that it's not like that was not a sexy model. It's just, you know, it's just a thing with the texture map. You throw it in and it, you know, it, it completely fits into the scene with the fire and the, and, the, and the robot dude and Adam. It just, it blows my mind. And what blows my mind even more is that next year we'll make this render available in Unity. So, and that means Unity Personal Plus and Pro so all Unity users that want to use Unity to create non-interactive content can use the Octane Render, and the visuals of this quality are now in reach for all artists that want to use Unity. I'm incredibly, <laughs> incredibly, incredibly happy about that. Now, with all this talk about artist tooling, you know, I think it's time to take a look at some actual artist work. And for that, I'd like to invite on stage Ben Cousins f to present his Project White project. Oh, here you are. Uh -huh. Sneak I up like on this. me there. Take that. There you go. Hi, everyone. So how would I describe the outsiders? Well, I'd say that we are a small, high-end entertainment studio. We're not a technology company. We want to spend our time working on great high-end content, great visuals, great gameplay, we don't want to spend our days wrestling with software. And Unity is, of course, the first choice when you're doing something like that. We're a small team. We're only nine developers with three managers, but we've got a lot of Unity experience. Between us, we've shipped or worked on around 10 Unity games. You might say we're experts in the engine. And we know that Unity is absolutely the first choice for producing great high-end content, great gameplay, great visuals, quickly and with a small team. Like a lot of entertainment studios, our products are based around the visions of one key individual. In our case, that's David Goldfarb. David's got an incredible, um, unbroken line of working on really essentially excellent high-end first-person games. We've been prototyping for the last year. Our prototype's got about two and a half hours of gameplay in it. We're going to show you about two and a half minutes of gameplay today. This was a completely gray box demo just three months ago. So all of the visuals that you see have been produced in the last three months. And I just want to make it clear, we're using completely off the shelf Unity 5.4. We've got no source code license. We don't have access to anything secret from Unity. We're not doing a load of stuff uh, under the hood ourselves. The game is uh, codenamed Project White. It may contain content that's inappropriate for children. <laughs> Let's head over to the demo. Project White is an RPG, and it's set in an alternate history of the early Viking era. And in this uh, alternate history, uh, human beings share the world with another race of intelligent creatures. Now, what's unique about Project White is that you see the world through the eyes of these creatures. And at the start of the demo, we're seeing the world through the eyes of a young creature, basically a child, as they look for their parents. Now, these creatures move on all fours. And young creatures are good at sneaking, climbing, and jumping. This is a brutal world. And human beings have almost eradicated your kind. Here we can see two humans hacking away at the corpse of your father, probably to take a trophy. Oh, they've seen us. We're going to have to run away. As a young creature, you're very weak. And you can be killed in one hit by even the weakest human. So you need to spend a lot of your time running away, hiding, and sneaking. So we're being chased by that one guy with the torch. Let's see if we can get across this bridge. Oh, no, there's another guy on the other side. Going to have to get out of here, Anders. 
Okay, that worked. As you explore the caverns and the crevices that these creatures inhabit, you'll see what human beings have done to your kind over the years. Here we can see the dried out corpse of an adolescent creature. But let's sneak to safety. Young creatures can make themselves very small and sneak through uh, small crevices and gaps that no human can follow. This huge, beautiful cave with a mysterious tree growing in the center is one of the few areas of refuge for creatures of your type. So that's the world seen through the eyes of a young creature, running away from even the weakest human. Let's move forward in time now and see the same world through the eyes of the same creature, but this time as an adolescent. Much stronger, much more powerful, and see what they're capable of. So that's Project White. What we're going to do now is we're going to open up the editor, and we're going to talk about a couple of the graphics techniques that we use to achieve what are pretty good high-end visuals. One of the things that's really important for us with this game is that because we have the camera so close to the ground, we need a lot of detail down there, more detail than you would need for a normal first-person game. Think about the camera at 1.5 to 2 meters for a first-person game, for a third-person game even higher up. So we concentrate a lot on uh, detail on the ground. Now, to do this, we used two combined techniques. One is a commercially available asset store, uh, asset library, and the other one is a readily available, inexpensive asset store um, tool. The textures themselves come from Quixel's Megascans archive. We know those guys. They're based close to us in Sweden. They've got really good high-end content. And we combine uh, the data from Megascans with a tessellation solution, which comes from an asset store tool called the Relief Terrain Pack. And Thomas, he's a one-man operator who created the Relief Terrain Pack. He's been working on the implementation of this with us, and we've achieved, I think, really good results. Now, we're ex-AAA guys, and we know that AAA teams, to achieve the same look, will send a bunch of guys in a plane to an exotic location, where they'll take a bunch of photos, they'll scan the environment, and then they'll write their own tessellation tool. And we think we've probably, solved one, uh, we've probably saved one to $200,000 by using this, this technique rather than the typical AAA method. Second thing I want to show you is how much of the visual quality of this demo comes from basic, standard, in-the-box Unity lighting features. Let's just turn off atmospheric scattering. You immediately see the huge effect that that technique is having. Now if we go through a lot of those camera effects that were shown earlier, the vignettes, uh, motion blur, um, ambient occlusion, color grading, you'll gradually see the, the quality of that scene reduce and reduce until we're just looking at the basic assets with the lighting. Now, if we keep looking at that same scene and gradually turn everything back on again, you'll again see how much of the visual quality of that demo comes from basic features which are available to all of you uh, as uh, Unity developers. Well, if you want to find out more about the, how we built this demo, we're doing a breakout session today at 5 o'clock. It's a QA. and a We'll have the editor up, and we can talk about our process a little bit. But uh, otherwise, thanks very much for your time. Cheers. <laughs> Hey, uh, thanks, Ben. And you know, it's a what you just showed. Project Y is a really beautiful game, and for me, it's kind of fun because I think, like all of you, I spent a great deal of my time gaming, you know, slaying monsters like that. It's kind of fun to get on the other side um, and see what it's like. Now, we've talked a fair amount today about VR and AR, and you know, Unity is 100% behind VR and AR. And you know, one of the things that um, we, we look to in the future is getting behind our developers in a bigger and better way. The future of VR is really important to us, so much so that we've actually hired a head of AR and VR strategy by the name of Tony Parisi. Now, some of you may have heard of Tony. He's a serial angel investor, a serial entrepreneur. He's co-created some of the important 3D graphics standards, including uh, VRML, X3D, and GLTF. 
Um, he is going to be overseeing partnerships for Unity globally um, and helping us in accelerate our investment in this important new area. We are so excited to have him as part of our team, and I'd like to have Tony come on stage from one side or the other and have him take the show away. Tony, welcome to the team, and welcome to the stage. Thank you, John. Thanks very much, John. Uh, delighted to be here, and uh, hello, everyone. I'm new to Unity, but I have been an, a fan of this company for a long time. It's created the most accessible pro game development tool there is in the world. So it's kind of no surprise to me that most of the VR and AR that you see these days was made with Unity. Now we're going to have some folks come up and give some talks and show some demos. But before that, I wanted to just share a little bit about our vision uh, for VR and AR at Unity. Uh, here, we think that immersive technologies like VR and AR represent the next computing platform. We're not just going to be using VR and AR to make games. We're going to tell stories and create worlds. We're going to design and sell products, make compelling presentations, and understand complex data. We're also going to share moments and hang out together online. You may recognize this young guy up here. At Oculus Connect last month, their developer conference, he gave a keynote, and he showed the company's vision for social interaction in the very near future in VR, with live avatars, photo sharing, streaming video, even a webcam to keep tabs on his dog back at home. It was a really great demo, and it was made with Unity. But that wasn't the only thing at Oculus Connect made with Unity. Oculus Rooms and Oculus Avatars were, as well as 22 of the 25 titles that were shown on the show floor. 22 out of 25 titles, that is astounding were made with Unity. But we actually want more. We want you to make all your VR and AR with Unity. So going forward, you're going to see a lot more investment on the part of Unity in VR and AR. Everything from HMD platforms to core tech to uh, the work at labs and in product and our global evangelism and our support for content creators with made, from, uh, with, made with Unity. So this is going to be great. Um, and one of the things I want to talk about now is, uh, I don't know if you folks saw the Daydream launch um, last month, but as you can imagine, most of the stuff there was made with Unity as well. And Google's here with us today to make some announcements. So without uh, further ado, I want to bring up Nathan Martz, who is the lead developer for the Daydream developer platform, the lead product manager. Come on up, Nathan. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tony. Hey everyone, I gotta say, it is incredibly exciting to be here. I, I don't know about you, but I find it to be incredibly inspiring to be surrounded by people who are committed to bringing new ideas to life. Uh, at Google, we very much share that passion uh, for bringing new ideas to life, for innovation, which is why just a few weeks ago, we announced the Pixel Phone and Daydream View. For months, our teams have been obsessing over the details, trying to get everything in the platform exactly right, from making sure that the phones are built for great VR, to fabricating viewers that are lightweight and comfortable, and of course, designing a controller that's accessible for new users, but also expressive for developers like you. But of course, it's not enough just to make something great. We want as many people in the world to experience VR as possible, so we've done the hard work to make sure that the viewer and the controller are sold together for a very affordable price. Now that's great, but I know that for all of you, that doesn't really matter until you can go to a store, buy one, take it home, and experience Daydream for yourself. So I'm very, very happy to say that you'll be able to do that just nine days from now on November 10th. So, <laughs> thanks. Now, for our team at Google, the launch of Daydream represents the culmination of an incredible amount of blood and sweat and tears and time and effort. Launching new hardware is extremely difficult. But honestly, we believe that people are not going to buy the hardware for the hardware's sake. They're going to buy it for the experiences that that hardware enables. And we know that the majority of those experiences won't be created at Google. They'll be created by developers like you. Now, as a former developer myself, I think Daydream actually provides some really, really interesting opportunities for innovation and creativity. Um, the first one 
is actually the Daydream controller itself. Even though it looks really simple, it's a three degree of freedom motion controller with a clickable touchpad and a couple of extra buttons, it's actually extremely expressive. You can do a lot with it because if you take the input from the controller and combine it from the context that your app provides, a little bit of your own creativity and some math, you can actually give your users a sense of hand presence in VR. You can create virtual objects that move directly based on what your users are doing with their hands. And that's really, really unique because up until today, hand presence was exclusively the domain of high-end PC-based VR. But with the Daydream controller, you can actually bring hand presence in VR to your users and do it at mobile scale. Speaking of mobility, uh, Daydream is it's mobile, right? It's based on your phone. That means that you can create immersive VR experiences that your users can take with them free of any tethers or anything else that links them to a single place uh, or single part of their world. Uh, of course, with great power comes uh, great uh, responsibility, right? And if you're building VR for a mobile device, it's actually challenging. Creating amazing apps that teleport users to new places that make them believe that they're physically present in other worlds is hard. It requires squeezing every ounce of performance possible out of the system. That's why we've established a deep partnership with Unity to bring a native integration for Daydream into Unity itself. This native integration is going to allow you to take advantage of all of Unity's fundamental innovations in VR, things like multi-threaded rendering, single-pass occlusion culling, uh, and shadow rendering. Um, it also guarantees that every improvement that Unity brings to VR in the future will also come to Daydream. In fact, today you can already check out this native integration through a technical preview. But I'm very happy to announce that starting in 5.6, Daydream will be part of mainline Unity, uh, which is super, super awesome. So that's great. Uh, we know that for many of you, you're going to be able to take Unity. You'll make amazing experiences that bring users through VR into the worlds that you've created. But we know that making an app is actually just the beginning. And you want to make great software, but you also want to be able to make a living doing it. So that means you need users to be able to find the content that you've built. And once they've found it, you need to be able to actually make money selling the app and selling goods in it. So we're going to highlight a couple things for you today. Uh, the first of them is, is Daydream Home. This is actually the first thing that users see when they put their phone in the viewer and step into VR. Those top three big tiles are called discovery windows. And they're actually surfaces where we can promote the best original content for Daydream. And the cool thing is that because we can actually deep link into apps, we can promote not just new apps, but new experiences within existing apps. That means when you upgrade an app, we can promote it, not just when you launch an app. Of course, monetization is also important. Once people have found your content, you want to be able to sell it to them. So with the launch of Daydream, we've brought Google Play into VR. That means users can shop in the Play Store, check out apps, buy and install them, all without leaving VR. It's an incredibly pleasant, low friction way to find new content. And for a developer, because all of this is built on top of the Play Store's foundation, you get everything you get with Play, from payments in dozens of different countries and currencies, to deep analytics, customer feedback and engagement features. Everything that you love about Play for Android is available for Daydream. So of course, we know that many of you have built businesses around actually selling content within your app. So we're very proud to announce that we're actually going to be bringing IAP into VR for Daydream day and date with launch. So regardless of whether you're a premium developer or a freemium developer or somewhere in between, you can bring your content, your business model to Daydream the day it launches. So I hope all of that gives you a sense of the depth and breadth of Daydream. But for me, you know, nothing speaks to the possibilities of a new platform better than to see what amazing creative developers are already making for it. So with that, I'd like to show you what a few of our best creators have already built with Daydream, uh, for Daydream with Unity.
So if you want to learn more, if you want to, <laughs> thank you very much. So yeah, if you want to learn more, if you want to become a Daydream developer yourself, check out developers.google.com slash VR, or check out our dedicated talk this Thursday. I want to thank you all so much for your time. We can't wait to see what you make, the amazing experiences that you create for Daydream. Thank you so much. With that, I'll hand it off to Dio. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nathan. Hi, everybody. I am Dioselin Gonzalez, VR Principal Engineer at Labs. Let's talk about video. Video playback is a very common scenario in games and other interactive experiences. And with virtual reality and 360 video, other kind of uh, immersive technologies, this is more the case. Do we have 360 creators, artists here in the audience? Great, I see some of you. Awesome, you're gonna like this. So. Uh, like I said, this is a very common scenario, much more the case with new immersive technologies. So it is natural that Unity would tackle this very seriously. And that's why I'm very happy to announce new work by our AV team today, which is a video player. Not just any video player. It's completely new, completely rewritten from scratch with performance in mind. The AV team created it um, completely up to take advantage of hardware acceleration. Uh, it plays, uh, it decodes H.264, VP8, and it's built to, to decode many other codecs. As with everything, Unity, of course, is multi-platform. And it's perfect for 360 videos, like I said. It's going to come to you for Unity 5.6. Now, you know what it is? Let's see how it works. I have a couple of demos here today to show you. The first demo, I have a simple scene here. And what I want to sh um, show you is how easy it is to set it up for 360 video. So I have a camera here. The camera just has a script that follows the mouse, so I can move it around, and a point light. So I'm going to create a sphere centering the origin. I'm going to assign a material to the sphere. This material is just a shader that flips the normal, so instead of going out, they're going to go in, so when I'm inside the sphere, I can see the video. And then I have here a 360 video that is 4K resolution. What I do, I drag it to the sphere, and then I have here a new video player component. So I'm just going to select autoplay, let's make it loop, and then hit play. And there it is. It's playing. You can see it in all its glory. 360 video 4K resolution. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So that's how easy it is to set up a 360 video um, experience. Now, uh, I have a second example that I wanted to show you today, which is developed by our friends from Mirada Studios. Mirada Studios, um, they're based here, by the way, and they, they, the way they describe themselves is as having creativity at its heart and technological innovation at, as its engine. That's quite cool, right? So thanks to them, to our partners at Mirada, they've been doing, by the way, th for three and a half years, they've been doing VR, AR, VFX, animations, etc. And they put together this interactive 360 experience. So let's say here, I'm, you know, in the office, Look it around, and I'm, you know, I just want to take a break. So should I go skiing? It's too cold for me. Should I go hiking in the mountains? I don't feel like the, like the heights today. I'm from the Caribbean, so I love the beach. So let's go to the ocean. And here it is. It's playing my video. I want to go close to the shore, and there it is. Let me just show it to you all in all 360 glory, and I'm just going to go back. So that's it. Um, as you can see, it's very, quite easy to, to set up, and it's coming to you, like I mentioned, for Unity 5.6. Hope you like it. <laughs> yes. All right, so with that, I want to introduce to you my colleagues, my co-workers from Unity Labs that are going to show you new work that we've been doing lately at Unity Labs. So with this, I want to present to you uh, Amir Ebrahimi. He's the lead architect for Editor VR, and Timoni West, our principal designer. Good <laughs> guys.
We've been hard at work since February, haven't we? It's been a long couple of months. Yeah, at at Vision Summit, we announced and showed off our first, uh, one of our first lab projects, a VR authoring tool. Since then, we've been building a strong foundation to support all all of the developer tools we expect to see coming from you for Editor VR. Now we're going to take a few minutes to show you what what you can expect to see in December. Hey, you have a Vive on this time. I have a Vive on? What? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, we support both. All right. How are we doing? Are we live? You are live. Take Sweet. it away. Sweet. OK, so as you can see, we are in the beautiful world of Firewatch. Thanks so much to Campo Santos for letting us use these amazing assets. How many of you guys have played Firewatch? You guys know the game? It's so great, right? Yes. I love it. I wish I was announcing Firewatch VR today, but I am not. OK. If you've played the game, or if you haven't played the game, you might notice this space is looking a little empty right now. So what I'm going to do is add some uh, objects to the scene view. So you see here is the Unity button. I click on that, and I get my main menu. And now I'm going to open up the project view. OK, so this is your project view. This is new. And this is called a workspace. It's basically the 3D equivalent of a window, so just like in the regular Unity, you can resize it to any size you want. You can put it wherever you want. And you've got your files on the left here. And then you have your game objects on the right. So I'm going to open up the desk thing here. I cleverly sorted my objects already. And I just start adding objects to the scene. And Mary, you want to talk a little bit about performance stuff? Sure. So if you're, if you're taking a look at the project workspace, you can see as she moves her pointer over different objects, we're only rendering one object at a time. If you're a VR developer, you likely already know why. It's for performance reasons. Also, I'll point out that this is just Unity's normal UI system. So as a developer, you're not building anything new. You don't have to learn anything new. This is important for us because we want you to be able to take the UIs you build for Editor VR and be able to transport them to your built players that you release. That's right. We want to make it really easy for you to just get running with this stuff. OK, so now you can see I have a totally messy desk. Yeah. One reason why we decided to go with Firewatch as opposed to a native VR experience is we think that this will be genuinely useful for you, even if you're not making a VR experience, if you're just making something in 3D. And I'm going to show that off by showing just how quickly it is to quickly lay out something like this that has a lot of components. So da -da 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 -da. Feel free to add your own music here as I do this. Camera. Thanks. <laughs> Mug. Pencil back up. OK, ta-da, really fast. It's just that easy to do it, just like doing it in real life. So you might notice some of these assets, obviously, they're a little bit off center, because I did that really fast. So there's a couple things you can do here. First, we have snapping tools. And secondly, you can actually just go back in here and bring up the inspector. So here you go. The inspector is blank to start off with, but you can see it's also a workspace. And I'm going to hit the typewriter here. And there you go. You've got your inspector in VR. Ta-da! <laughs> and it looks gorgeous, by the way. Special shout out here to Dylan for making this absolutely beautiful interface. So uh, I'm going to click here in local rotation. And this little keyboard's going to pop up. Yeah, so this is an example of one of our UIs. It's the numeric input UI. We have two different keyboards. We have a full-size keyboard. However, this one's much easier to enter numeric input for your float fields or your integer fields. That's right. Um, editing or typing in VR is a little bit different than typing on a physical keyboard. So the cool thing about this is, is it's specialized. If when it's at an angle like this, you hit the trigger to type in the numbers. But if you actually take it and point it down like so, you, it switches over a drum pad. And then you can type much more uh, fast, but it's a little bit less precise. So that's the kind of thing we're working on right now. Awesome. So I think we have a few more workspaces to show, too. We have the console and the profiler, which you've seen before. Can you bring those up? Sure, of course. Everybody loves the console and the profiler, right? In VR? Where are my VR devs at? You guys know you want this. <laughs> All right, so as you can see, these have been workspacified again. Again, you can move them. You can resize them. You can also move them all together at the same time. And if you locomote anywhere in the space, they'll just follow you around. 
And we have this other workspace, right? The chessboard? That's right, we got the chessboard. How many of you guys remember this? You might have seen it at GDC if you were there earlier this year. So the chessboard, thanks for coming, one guy. <laughs> 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 All right, so the chessboard is a mini map of the same view that you're already in. You can move around objects, especially large scale objects. You can move yourself from location to location. But I actually want to show you something a little inception. You want to see Amir? What do you mean? All right, check it out. I'm going to open up a second chessboard here. You can do two chessboards? Two chessboards. <laughs> <laughs> Not one, two. One, two. And I've got the same view here. And I'm actually going to pick up the typewriter from this view. Now I can just pull this typewriter out and put it next to me. This is really handy if you've got something far away that you just want to get back next to. But I can put it back in the scene here, or I can actually just move it into another scene like so. Ta-da! So this is helpful if you're moving. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Chirpy shit. So this is kind of a rando example, but we honestly think this will be really useful if you're doing things like moving large objects or small objects to a large or a far away distance. All right, well, I think that's about all we got to show to you today. No, that's not all. We still have one more thing. What? One more thing? Yeah. What is it? Open up your tools pane on your main menu. Tools pane? What are tools? So tools are VR-specific extensions to editor VR. This is where you guys come in. We have an open API that allows anyone to quickly build new functionality or extend existing functionality. So. The first tool we want to highlight is a tool called Creations. This is made by Milan and Dario of Nevermind. It, it took them only two weeks to get this into Editor VR. It allows you to SDF sculpt. Yeah, ready to get some sculpting in Unity in VR? Let's do it. Here we go. Ta-da. <laughs> Amir, what do you think? Mm, I wouldn't quit your day job. Oh, harsh but fair. <laughs> All right, how about this other tool, Tavori? So yeah, Tavori is another tool. It's uh, available on Steam Early Access right now, uh, also built in Unity. Um, but we worked with this team in Moscow. It's Dimitri and Victor. And they basically took their core functionality from Tavori and brought it into Editor VR, also in two weeks. We don't give anyone any time, do we? All right, so how many people have tried out Tavori on early access on Steam? Anybody in the room familiar? A couple of people, okay. So the interface, so if you do try it out, is the exact same as it is here. So what I do is when I hit the record button here, any object that I move from here on out has its movements recorded on this timeline. So for example, if I want to have the camera say fall on the ground, I can just go like that. If I pick up the pencil, I just start drawing like so. I'm going to hit pause. And when I go back and hit play, it not only moves on the screen, but you can also see it moving directly in VR. So we think a tool like this will be helpful for you VR developers to quickly prototype your animations. Yeah, plus when you start moving the cups back and forth, it gets this real like Disney VR guest kind of vibe. I've VR seen her do this. I mean, we've been practicing a lot, so I've been seeing her do this, but it's still funny to it's still fun to watch. All right, so that's what we got. So there's a lot more functionality to explore, and we'll be going over that in our talk tomorrow. When is that? 11:30. See you guys there. Before we finish, here's an important point that I want to emphasize to you, our community. We've built EVR to, for you to take it and run with it. We don't have all the answers for VR. No one does. We're giving you a baseline of useful tools to get you started, and we think you'll quickly want to experiment with your own. And that's why we've prioritized EVR from the ground up to be fully extensible and open source. Because we're most excited to see what amazing tools you're going to build for it, and our goal is to support you. Thank you. Cat. Yeah, I'm gonna shut up. Okay. And here to speak more about creating tools with and for Unity is Kat Stafford, our VP of Marketing. Kimini. Hello.
That was an amazing demo, you guys. Nice work. It's great to see you all. So we've seen some impressive new technology today, but there is one thing that impresses us more than some of the things we've shared with you today. And that's what we see you make with Unity. You make games across every imaginable genre, from arcade to racing to fighting, strategy, and everything in between. You make games with incredibly original art direction, with art styles inspired with, by uh, 2D subway maps, by artists like MC Escher, and even visions of a future with a failed utopia. But you don't just make games anymore. With Unity, you're making interactive children's stories and toys. You're making, toy, you're making tools in VR to allow other people to make music and art. And you've taken Unity far beyond entertainment. You are helping doctors visualize how drugs are interacting with cancer cells. You're helping architects see their creations, their designs, come to life long before any ground is broken. And you're helping countless industries with new and powerful training tools and simulations. You have proven time and time again that anyone, anywhere, can make anything with Unity. A single person made this RTS RPG action hybrid. One person. A small indie studio made this platformer. It's gorgeous and critically acclaimed. A veteran studio pivoted to VR so they could put us in the shoes of an elite secret agent. And Nintendo. Nintendo, yeah. <laughs> Making Super Mario with Unity. Bringing a beloved character originally created over 30 years ago to mobile for the first time with Unity. Ultimately, Made with Unity is a celebration of all of you, so we hope we see you in the Connect beta. We hope we see you at the Made with Unity showcase, and of course, at the Unite party this week. So again, thank you. Thank you for your innovation, your creativity, your hard work, and your passion, and we look forward to seeing what you make with Unity next. Thanks, Kat. So um, we're getting close to a wrap up here. And normally, what I would do, and will do again, is thank all of you. Now, we're very much dedicated to our mission, um, democratization of gaming, um, enabling success, solving hard problems. And I'm so proud of everything you've made. But I think it's worth notice, or at least mention for me today, I couldn't be more proud of the team at Unity. The stuff I saw today, I, it's just exciting as all hell. So I am so proud of the work they're doing, and I hope you are too. Um, now, it's my great pleasure next to introduce someone that really needs um, no introduction. He'll be closing off our session. The effervescent and ebullient emperor of evangelism, Carl, will you take the stage from wherever you are? There he is. <laughs> Go, Carl. Go. I just... <sighs> wow. <laughs> I'm fired up. This is amazing to see so many people. Wow. Well, it was phenomenal, mind-blowing for me to see all those new features, those new platforms that we can use to create faster and better games. But there's a lot more going on at Unite. So you might be wondering how we're going to get all the information. We partnered up together with Alchemy to make a VR experience to get you right away ready. So let me set it up. Okay. You ready? <laughs> Job Simulator Unite. Okay. Okay. So now get me help you ready. Okay. And let's put it in my virtual office. Hello. So on the back of your badge, you have a QR code. Grab your phone. Ah, not this one. 
Yeah. So grab your mobile phone, scan the batch, and download the Unity app to get access to the map. Right. There you're going to find your way to the expo hall, to the uh, Unity kiosks, and also to the expo hall and the made with Unity. But also, the app has a full schedule. <laughs> so you can attend all the different lectures. And when you fill in the survey on the end of each presentation, you actually make the chance to win a prize. Yeah. And it's this beautiful scarf. OK. I'm here in my virtual office, but we're all in LA, the city of amazing tattoo artists. If you go to the registration desk, you will actually get all the information to get a real tattoo, a real Unity tattoo. Not a virtual one, a real Unity tattoo. Come on, who doesn't want a Unity tattoo? <laughs> and after all, it's on us. Yeah. Unite is not only about technical talks, but it's also about mingling with your friends, networking, socializing, and having some drinks. That's why we host two, not one, two cocktail parties. And the first one is on Tuesday. Okay, <laughs> I broke the bottle. Uh, and after that is the Made of Unity Award Show, the one and only exclusive show. So beautiful, I'm gonna put it here. And after that, you can actually play all the games at the Made of Unity, the bottle here, the Made of Unity section. So go play the, all the games. Woo! Yeah. The second cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> The second cocktail party <laughs> is Wednesday from 6.30 to 8.30 p 8 p.m. Then from 8 p.m. until 9 p.m., don't forget, and just until 9 p.m., the buses will leave, you, will leave to take a real ride. Not a virtual ride, but a real ride. At the Unity Party, who is hosted at Universal Studios. Yeah. So, to kick off Unite, let's get party. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs>